Apple recently announced the new MacBook Air, which continues to deliver some incredible features in a super thin design at a reasonable price. And it's caused some people to wonder how Apple was able to make the MacBook Air 28% thinner than the MacBook Pro, even though it has a similar display, keyboard, trackpad, and battery. In fact, why don't they just make the MacBook Pro as thin as MacBook Air and only sell one laptop instead of two different models? Well, it's because each product has completely opposite design goals. The purpose of MacBook Air is to be as thin as possible, while the purpose of MacBook Pro is to be as powerful as possible. And it turns out that you can't do both at the same time, at least not very well. That's why when the original MacBook Air came out in 2008, Apple had to make some unprecedented compromise to achieve its small size. At the time, it was the thinnest laptop in the world, measuring 0.76 inches at one end and tapering to 0.16 inches at the other. That made it 57% smaller by volume than the MacBook, which meant Apple had to take out a lot of stuff. And they started with the SuperDrive, which may not seem important today, but was required for computers back then. That's how you installed apps, imported music from CDs, and watched movies from DVDs. And Apple did offer a partial solution with a software feature called Remote Disk, but it required owning a second computer, which not everyone had. So Apple was happy to sell you an external super drive for $100 that plugged into the Air's USB port. And ports were another big compromise. The MacBook Air only had one USB port, a micro DVI port for external displays, and a headphone jack. That was it while the MacBook had two USB ports, a mini DVI port, a Firewire port, an Ethernet port, a headphone jack, and an audio in jack. Plus, it had a built-in super drive. So right away, you begin to see what users had to give up in order to enjoy a thinner MacBook. But that wasn't all. The largest component inside any laptop is the battery. So to save space, Apple did a couple things. They removed the components that made the battery user replaceable, and they glued the battery directly to the Air's chassis, meaning users could no longer quickly swap out a low battery for a fully charged spare, and would eventually need to pay Apple to completely replace the battery once depleted. Apple also made the battery smaller, resulting in the Air having a 37 watt hour battery, while the MacBooks was 55 watt hours. That's a 33% drop in capacity to achieve a thinner design. Now, having a smaller battery means it's important to make it last as long as possible. To do that, Apple had to make another compromise, less processing power. They actually worked with Intel to custom build a low power processor specifically for MacBook Air. It was 60% smaller, consumed less power, and generated less heat than the MacBook's chip, but ran at a lower clock speed of 1.6 or 1.8 GHz compared to 2.1 or 2.4 GHz, resulting in 20-30% to slower processing speed on the Air. It also turned out that the 2.5-inch hard drives used in previous MacBooks were too big to fit inside the Air. So Apple used the iPod's smaller 1.8-inch hard drive instead, but it ran at 4,200 RPM compared to 5,400, resulting in 23% slower read and write speeds. The smaller drive also meant less storage capacity, at 80 GB standard compared to 120 on the MacBook. The MacBook Air even had an optional 64GB storage upgrade for $1,000, which may be confusing since you were paying a lot more for less, but that's because the real upgrade was the type of drive, rather than the capacity. Being a solid state drive instead of hard disk, it had about 6.5 times faster read and write speeds, faster boot times, quicker file transfers, and improved system responsiveness but many reviewers complained that they couldn't fit all their applications and files on an 80 gigabyte hard disk drive, let alone a 64 gigabyte solid state drive. There were also compromises made to the RAM modules, which were soldered directly to the logic board to save space, preventing users from accessing or upgrading it themselves. Instead, if customers expected they'd need more RAM in the future, they were forced to buy Apple RAM at the time of purchase, which was two to four times more expensive than identical RAM sold by third parties. 
So users not only accepted serious compromises to enjoy a thinner laptop, but also had to pay a higher price, since the Air was $700 more than the MacBook. Now, if you're wondering who actually bought the original MacBook Air, it was mostly traveling business people. But over time, that would change completely. Most of the Air's compromises either became irrelevant or were remedied. For example, hardly any laptops have super drives or user replaceable RAM these days, so customers don't really miss those features anymore. But things like battery life are still relevant and have improved dramatically on the MacBook Air, from 5 hours in 2008 to 18 hours today, not only due to better battery technology, but also improvements in power efficiency. Plus, cost has come down. MacBook Air is now Apple's most affordable laptop, starting at $1,000 instead of $1,800. And while performance has improved with Apple moving away from Intel to their own custom chips, it still isn't the Air's primary design goal. That is reserved for the MacBook Pro, which offers up to 50% faster processing and up to two times faster graphics thanks to the M4 Pro and Max chips. And if you're wondering why Apple can't just put those chips in the MacBook Air, it's because of two things, power draw and heat. In fact, the larger size of the MacBook Pro is primarily just to accommodate the higher power chips, and that comes with compromises of its own. More power draw means the Pro needs a larger battery. At 69.6 watt hours, it's 23% larger than the Air's 53.8 watt hour battery, requiring a much larger and heavier power brick. The M4 Pro and Max chips also generate more heat, so MacBook Pro needs a larger cooling system with two fans and a bigger heatsink. MacBook Air, on the other hand, doesn't need any fans. This not only saves space, but allows the laptop to run completely silent. Making MacBook Pro bigger also gave Apple space to add extra features the Air doesn't have, like a larger display at 14 and 16 inches compared to 13.6 and 15.3, or more ports, like three USB ports instead of two, an HDMI port, and an SD card slot. The MacBook Pro also has space to house a larger, high-fidelity speaker system, with force-canceling woofers and a wider soundstage, compared to the Air's speakers that, while good for their size, just can't match the Pro's sound quality and projection. And those differences are why Apple offers two different laptops for two different types of customer. This actually goes back to a product matrix Steve Jobs drew up in 1997. It featured four boxes representing four products a laptop and desktop for everyday users, and two additional models for pro users. Apple still follows this strategy today, because as Jobs said, products are packages of emphasis. And what you might emphasize for everyday users isn't the same as what you'd emphasize for professionals, which is why the MacBook Air is driven by conveniences, like a thin, light, compact design, perfect for carrying around all day, with silent operation and a small charging brick plus a chip that stays cool so you can comfortably use it on your lap. You can even get a MacBook Air in sky blue, something that's never been available on a pro Apple laptop. But professionals don't find these conveniences as important. Instead, they want as much performance as possible, even if it means a thicker, larger, heavier design with noisy fans and a higher, slightly more uncomfortable operating temperature. And while it would be great to have a thin and light professional performance laptop, the laws of physics just haven't allowed that. Yet. This is Greg with Apple Explained. Thanks for watching till the end, and I'll see you in the next video.